eye-to-eye -eye with thyroid eye disease. Management of thyroid eye disease, non-surgical treatment during the active phase. Hi, Dr. Soparker again. Welcome to the second video in Section 8 of PESA Productions Thyroid Eye Disease 10-part series. In the previous video in this section, we discussed some of the things that can be done to maintain eye comfort and what things might prompt more urgent aggressive intervention. This video addresses non-surgical options during the times of vision-threatening changes in the active phase of thyroid eye disease. For the most part, the pros and cons of specific medications and their roots and frequency of administration are not elaborated here, as these discussions really need to be tailored to each person's specific situation. However, the overall types of treatments available are summarized with broad paint strokes and should provide an overall view of therapeutic options. The material in this series is meant to be easily understood. Parts, however, may be somewhat dense, and you may wish to review particular sections. If you have suggestions on how to improve this series, we welcome your comments. You may find us on the web at www.plasticeyesurgery.com, email us at info at pesahouston.com, write to us at Plastic Eye Surgery Associates, 3730 Kirby Drive, Suite 900, Houston, Texas, 77098, or telephone us at 713-795-0705. If vision or comfort is threatened during the active phase of thyroid eye disease, there are several interventions which may be implemented. Nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory medications are often a first-line treatment for minor concerns. Nonsteroidals such as ibuprofen or naproxen are common non-prescription choices for control of relatively minor swelling or discomfort. However, under slightly more problematic situations, a prescription nonsteroidal such as diclofenac, brand name Voltaren, might be a reasonable choice. Prescription corticosteroids are probably the most common initial choice by physicians for the management of thyroid eye disease. There are two reasons for the broad popularity of these drugs. The first is that they act very quickly and are highly effective in diminishing acute thyroid eye disease symptoms within 24 hours. The second is that for short course therapy of merely days duration, corticosteroids are relatively safe for most non-diabetics. Diabetics may have a significant problem with high-dose corticosteroids. However, as we've seen, the active phase of thyroid eye disease may last years, and long-term corticosteroid use is clearly associated with a wide range of serious side effects throughout the whole body that are both dose and duration related. Among these complications, weight gain is one of the least dangerous, yet one of the most troubling to people. Corticosteroids, such as prednisone, may be given in many ways, by mouth, by vein, or locally injected into the tissues around the eyes. Additionally, corticosteroids may be given every day or in pulse treatments over different days or weeks apart. A large number of other autoimmune modulators have been used with considerable success in severe thyroid eye disease. Many of these medications have been used for other severe autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis or as chemotherapy adjuvants in cancers. Although these can be highly effective, these medications have several problems. First, they may take days to many weeks to have a significant impact on disease. Second, they often have relatively infrequent, but sometimes very severe toxicities to specific organs, such as the liver or kidney. Third, they are very often difficult to get approved by insurance companies for the treatment of thyroid eye disease and the medications are frequently extremely expensive. One of the easiest non-corticosteroid immunomodulators to get approved by insurance companies is rituximab. However, this chemotherapy agent runs about $10,000 per treatment and carries a death rate of about 2.5%, meaning that somewhere around two to three people out of every 100 are believed to die as a direct result of complications from this medication. There are, of course, other immunomodulators that have much safer treatment profiles. External beam irradiation can be an excellent option for controlling thyroid eye disease progression in some people, providing what is essentially equivalent to six to nine months of corticosteroid therapy, but without the same side effect risks. This is different from the radioactive iodine drink or pill used to ablate overactive thyroid glands. 
External beam irradiation is often provided in 10 consecutive working days over two weeks. External beam irradiation may not be appropriate for people with diabetes, concurrent chemotherapy, or serious microvascular disease, such as occurs with heart and kidney trouble from untreated high blood pressure, or other autoimmune diseases such as lupus. There are, however, four downsides to orbit irradiation. First, a highly experienced interventional radiologist needs to be used to avoid complications such as skin burns, hair loss, severe dry eye, or even vision loss. Second, it takes one to two weeks for radiation to effectively decrease local disease, and during this time, corticosteroids are often required to minimize the initial increase in swelling. Third, once administered, it is nearly impossible to know whether or not the active phase has ended, since the effects of irradiation typically persist for six to nine months. Thus, even if the active phase has ended, no definitive treatment can be instituted until nine months have passed. Last, there is a limited amount of radiation that is safe for the eyes, and treatment should be carefully planned with potential future needs in mind. Surgical decompression of the orbit and optic nerve are extremely effective options, but are usually relegated to the last choice, after all other options are considered, since we would rather leave surgery until the inactive or restorative phase. In general, we try to avoid operating during the active phase of thyroid eye disease for two reasons. First, thyroid eye disease creates structural changes in the tissues in the, of the orbit and the eyelids. If we operate during an active phase and changes continue, we may have to operate again and again and again to accommodate the changes that occur. Second, thyroid eye disease is an autoimmune disease propagated by the immune system. One way to stimulate the immune system is to traumatize the tissues. Surgery is trauma. We have seen numerous cases of thyroid eye disease sent to us in which the disease was significantly fired up by local surgery or trauma. Cases where a person presented to a plastic surgeon saying they had dramatically aged in the past few weeks or months. In the absence of disease or profound stress, such rapid aging does not occur. Missing the diagnosis of active thyroid eye disease and traumatizing the eyelids with surgery may have profound consequences as seen in these poor fellows whose disease was greatly exacerbated. These photos show tremendous swelling around the eyes from very active thyroid eye disease. All of the interventions introduced during the active phase of disease modify the effect of the disease, but they do not stop the disease. An analogy I use is consider a pile of burning coals creating a fire. The coals represent thyroid eye disease and the flames represent active disease creating eye changes. We have no bucket of water to pour on the coals to put them out, but we do have a wet blanket representing the various treatments available to us. This wet blanket effectively covers the coals and smothers the flames, stopping further progression of the thyroid eye disease. However, the coals beneath the blanket are still burning and if we take away the wet blanket, the coals will produce flames again, and the eye disease will progress. So if we wish to protect the eyes from further damage, we must leave the blanket on the coals until they die down by themselves or burn themselves out. Perhaps it is now clear how the interventions that we can employ do not cure thyroid eye disease, but simply decrease the impact of the disease on our tissues. Since, as we've discussed, the majority of the suppressing treatments that we can use during the active phase of the disease have potentially significant bad side effects, we try not to use these measures for as long as we can and intervene with these treatments only under the circumstances discussed above. What happens after a person has made it through the active phase and passed into the stable phase? We enter a recovery phase. The recovery phase consists foremost of continued surveillance for potential disease reactivation, which we will remember occurs at least 5% of the time. During the recovery phase, definitive reconstruction can be offered, and this is discussed in the next video. The essential points of this video are that several options exist for the non-surgical management of vision-threatening complications from thyroid eye disease. However, since all of the active phase suppressing treatments have serious potential side effects and complications, we try to avoid using these as long as we can. But if intervention is needed, many potent and aggressive treatments are available to preserve vision.